this parable tonight. So Matthew chapter 7. Um, we will. Um, so so it's three weeks ago that I gave the introduction, part one, to the parables of the Bible. And so now we're finally going to get started. And if you have the old uh, introduction sheet that I gave you, we won't necessarily follow the outline or the the pattern of the the parables as they're listed out on that sheet. We likely will look at all of those parables, especially the New Testament ones. We'll look at a few of the Old Testament ones, uh, but we, that, that'll be the aim throughout the summer, through the, for the Sunday night times throughout the summer, is to uh, examine the parables of the Bible. And so I don't have any real rhyme or reason. And I, I thought, well, at first I thought, well, why not take them in the chronological order in which Jesus taught them in? That would be a great way. And that will largely follow the New Testament parables as they're laid out in, in the list there, but not specifically. Because sometimes uh, the, the Matthew will record them in a different, uh, what would appear to be a different chronological order than, say, Mark or, or Luke would. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, will, will it be a rather random, even somewhat, may even feel somewhat extemporaneously just uh, grabbing a parable and let's look at it and take a peek at it. So that's essentially how we're going to go there with those. About my anticipation is probably about July, late July into early August. Uh, we'll take a peek at a handful of the Old Testament parables. And then we'll get back to some of the latter parables uh, that Jesus teaches and lay them out in that way. So there we have uh, a, a catch up on the introduction of the parables. It, I think on the back table are still some of those, um, that introduction that we gave for the parables a couple of weeks ago. If you want to be reminded uh, of, of what a parable is, how it, it, is it at all like an analogy? And yes, it is, but not always. Is it uh, short? Yes, usually. Are they long? Some are. Uh, but none of the parables that Jesus teaches are anything like, uh, like, like the epic poems or the epic uh, allegories of John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress, and the, uh, the Holy War. Not, not at all that involved, that detailed, that, that uh, spectacular in, in, in the sense of the storytelling, Jesus' parables are generally what they, as they get recorded for us, rather short. This one that we're going to look at this evening is really just a, 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 it's four, four verses long. And, uh, and, and really at the end of the observation of it, it's only three verses long. We have a little bit of an introduction. What's he saying? Why is he saying this? And then we have a conclusion as to here's what he said. And here were the here were those who listened to it, and here here are those who heard it. We're going to take a parable this evening that many times gets relegated to the children's story. It, it's fitting for children. It's a good story. It's applicable. It's easy to understand. But the danger that we do whenever we relegate something out to the children's corner or over to the children's department or into the the the, the genre of children's story is that we forget to look at it. And we forget the profoundness of what's in it. And so we're going to start here. This is the conclusion of the, par of the Sermon on the Mount. The parable that we'll look at is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, historians are, are uh, notably, they differ on, is the Sermon on the Mount one continuous sermon? Or is the collection of sermons that Jesus taught that then later became known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I, I don't know if, if one argument is better than the other. We certainly know this, that in, in the layout of Matthew's recording of this, all the way back to chapter 5, where essentially the sermon begins. So we need the setting. So this is an important thing to do with a parable. We have to have some background. We can take the story and pull it out of its context of the larger background of it and still get that value and benefit of it. But if we don't keep it connected as to why Jesus says this and to who he's saying this to, we can lose some of the emphasis 
of what would be beneficial for us. So take a step back from those three verses of the parable of the two foundations, and we observe what's the setting here. Well, chapter 5, verse 1 says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up into the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to well, we can even get some better benefit of having a, a verses from the previous chapter at large and say, well, who are these crowds that are following Jesus? Why is, why is, it, why is it mentioned in chapter 5, verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds? What brought up, what, 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 what's brought up the large gathering of people? Well, it's coming from the reputation that we'll see at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount that people are completely struck by the authority in which Jesus teaches. Note this. They are not captivated by his storytelling cleverness. That's of a whole another issue. They are captivated, we'll see it in the text, by the authority in which he teaches. So, again, from borrow some from our introduction to the parables, and why Jesus used parables, again, it's not necessarily like what gets promoted today, that Jesus taught in parables because it was something that everyone could relate to. His intentionality of preaching and using parables in his teaching was that his followers would know what he said. It was not for the benefit of the unconverted or the uninterested. His storytelling was for the benefit of the follower, that they might know what he's saying. Also, we know this about the setting here. The Sermon on the Mount gets, in, 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 in the historic paintings and drawings of history of the Sermon on the Mount, and I, I argue it's a good representation. There's a mass of people there on the hillside. So you think about any kind of artwork you've ever seen of someone, uh, of an artist portraying the Sermon on the Mount. I believe it's a proper interpretation to put a lot of people there. The scripture says there was a large crowd that followed him there. But Jesus was not teaching the Sermon on the Mount to the large crowd. He was speaking to the disciples, which is statistically a much smaller, uh, intimate group. So the Sermon on the Mount, even though there's a large crowd of people here, and some in the crowd, I believe, are benefiting from the teaching. But we know this, that even some who are there hearing the teaching, they be, their spirit begins to become disturbed because they know this man speaks with authority and he is on the verge of ruining every trick we put in front of him. And it bothers them greatly. So fast forward then, chapter 7. To the conclusion of the sermon and uh, verse 24 will actually require us to look at a couple of the verses prior to this but let's look at verse 24 therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock so let's at least deal with Jesus is setting up for making a comparison. Uh, right now, all we know in the text that we're reading, we know that there's two men that he's talking to, two houses and two foundations. But at this point, he's saying, therefore, so in, in response to everything that I've been teaching, so think back over, he's told us about, about how men are to be blessed, uh, that we are to, we are to be pursuers of holiness and righteousness, the hunger and thirst for the things of God, to, to be broken in spirit. He, he teaches about, uh, about adultery. He teaches about, uh, uh, in, in, in beautiful pictures, word pictures of how people who, are, can, who consider themselves followers of God are to live their lives out. And it challenges the status of the day. It really calls them out as really not being truth seekers themselves. So when, when, the, when Matthew records this, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words, he's, he's now addressing 
everyone who's hearing the teaching. I would say, in a similar way, we take a, a, a moment and consider the history of some of these hymns. Everyone who hears these hymns, everyone who hears this sermon, everyone who hears these words in this sermon, whether they're currently present and they've heard these words or through the blessing of the Holy Spirit, everyone who will have opportunity to read these words or hear preaching from these words of mine and acts on them, he will be compared to a man, a wise man who built his house on the rock. Well, let's, let me go ahead and read verse 24, 25, 26, 27. We'll use verse 28 and 29 for the conclusion um, of the observation of, of the parable. So therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and, the, and, and it slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall. For it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Well, just for, just for the sake of, of the story here, this is not the great conclusion. Pay close attention to this, and don't worry about everything else. This summarizes everything. This is a picture of those who have heard everything that's been said. And interestingly, he says, and act on these things. There's an implication. Because arguably, one could say to obey God is an act and to disobey God is to act on these things. It's clear that he's saying those who are going to act in the positive. They're going to do these things. They're going to, they're going to follow these things. This one is like the man who built his house on a rock. To compare the others, one who hears these things and he says it does not do these things is still an act. On the sand. So we have two individuals that Jesus says, when you hear these words of mine, those who those who now respond or don't respond accordingly are like one of two men. You're either like a wise man or you're like a foolish man. Well, no one likes to be called a fool, do they? And you can imagine, because we have the setting, there's Jesus' his intent to teach here is to the disciples, but there are others who are there, some curious observers, some of them intentional because they've heard rumors uh, that this, this guy may have, he may perform a trick while we're there and uh, we don't want to miss that. Uh, others are hearing or they're there because they're, they're questioning now the authority in which Jesus is teaching. But primarily Jesus is speaking to his disciples and to those who are on the skirts, the skirting edge of this. If you're hearing these things now, and you act upon these things. You're like a wise man. So this, there, there you have a wise man and a foolish man. The wise man puts these words into practice. The foolish man does not put these words into action. So let's, let's ask a couple of questions along the way. So this is designed for some interaction. There's not trick questions. I, I'll always let you know with a with a parenthetical statement before I give you a trick question. And the parenthetical statement will be, this is a trick question. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> this is not a trick question. Okay. So how, how many houses appear in the parable? Two. How many, how many men are in the story? There's two. And uh, how many foundations? How many builders are there? All right. So we have two houses, two men, two foundations, two builders. What are the two different kinds of foundation? Rock and sand. 
See, this is why this is why it gets pushed off to the children. This is this is simple, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and it's a visual picture there. This is perfect. Well, now, Pastor John, I know you know what a wadi is. I think you've even been swimming in one in Yemen. I'm not sure if I was supposed to announce that you've done that or not, but but you have. Uh, a, a wadi is a. It, you, go ahead and give us a description of a wadi because you have first hand knowledge of a wadi. Basically, a wadi is sort of the Middle Eastern version of a, an arroyo. And uh, it's basically a source, a spring or a water source that many times is a flooded um, water source when the rains come. And uh, when the rains come, literally, uh, those things become raging. And when the rains are not there, sometimes those wadis are not existing. Yeah. So it's essentially for a, for a good number, maybe even the majority of the days, it's a dry creek bed, if you will. But when a, when it rains 100 miles north, you better get out of the wadi. It may not rain where you're at, but you better get it raining upstream. Because that rain, as, it's, as the water is coming off of the really the barren, vegetation-less hillside, Water just rushes. All of it goes into the wadi. And then it essentially is a wall of water that's pushing through. And so that's part of the setting. That's part of, you just imagine where Jesus is at. Now, Steve, I don't know if on your journey to the promised land, did, did they talk to you about specific places where some of the parables were taught? Oh. And you, you'd have a visual. And uh, I've only seen pictures. And uh, a gentleman, uh, uh, the, the follow the rabbi guy. Oh, oh forgot his Ray. name. I can't, I, his name's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, he has a he, he's done a lot of research, and so to get the visual aid of exactly where Jesus is at when he's teaching a parable such as this, everyone present knows what a wadi is, and they know exactly what he's talking about. That they're in a place, they're on a hillside, they're on a, they're on a place where if it were to rain upstream from here, we would see a wall of water rush through this place. And Jesus is essentially using the setting of where he's at. Simple, it's practical, it's visual, but know this, he's not doing this to impress people. He's doing it and he's using the simplicity of it to teach profound, deep theological things. So it's not just this, a good little story where everyone goes home and says, yeah, I get that. I, I know what he's talking about. Think about this further. Uh, may, maybe for us as Westerners, the best picture of a wadi would be, I, 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 I've never done extensive, well, I think only one, maybe one time in, in a, a journey Renee and I made through Arches National Park, or was it Zion National Park? I don't remember, but a very similar type of terrain where there's very little vegetation around, and when it rains, the water just doesn't, the, the, the ground just doesn't absorb it. It's like it's raining on pavement. And so the water just accumulates and rushes. And there's signs that you cannot be in this place when it's raining. And uh, if, there's, if there's even an idea, and usually in the late afternoons of certain seasons of the year, especially whenever the monsoon season is in place, you just have to be a smart person and avoid these places. Um, otherwise, you're likely going to die. Flash floods. Yeah, flash flood where the ground is either completely saturated and no longer absorb anything, or it's so hard that that, that water just rushes off of it. Um, maybe to just drive that point even one step further, I collect rainwater off of one side of my, uh, of, I said my, it's Renee's studio my garage but it's her studio i collect water off of, of one side of it and and you do you know that a three tenths of an inch of rain will fill up 300 gallons of water <laughs> i'm shocked by it every time i go out that wasn't much of a rain and you go out there and i can't move the water barrels they're just packed full so it doesn't take a lot of rain for a lot of water to get rushing so Jesus is saying here, there's two types of builders. There's two men. There's two kinds of foundations. 
Now, he doesn't say this, but you can almost visually see. Uh, take a look at that guy over there. Look where he built his house. And I want you to pay close attention to where this guy built. There's two different places. One is on a high place. One is on a rocky place. Probably really difficult to get to. Hard to establish a place of, of, of residence in that place. But look at it and pay attention to it. And now look how easy it was. This guy could drag up the timber to build his house down from downstream. He could just pull it up on that soft, smooth, sandy creek bed. That's easy, quick to do. And why not? Why not work easier than work harder? So he's making essentially a visual that everyone who's here is present is getting the setting. They see it. So, so we know there's two men. We know there's two foundations. We know there's two houses. We know there's two builders, two men, two builders, with two, two kinds of foundations. Also note in, in the parable, in verses 24 and 26, uh, who does the rain fall on? Yes. Whose house does the wind blow against? Both of them. Whose house is caught in a flood? Certainly the foolish man's house. The waters rise and put the man who's built his house on a rock even at risk. So the rains have fallen, the winds have blown against them both, and the floods have come up. Both in both accounts, verse in verse 24 and verse 26. See it again. The the, the acts so so pay attention to these things Jesus is saying. And that he may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew. He's speaking about the man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell on it, the floods came up, and the wind blew against him. What does Jesus say is the is the end of that man's building? Yet it did not fall. For it's been founded on the rock. Now, we get this about Jesus. He's not just making a statement about construction. He's using something that the audience, that his disciples would get this. Those who, who, who are even unconverted would get this. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You know, who builds a house on, a, on sandy soil? Nobody does that. Well, apparently some people do. Who builds houses where wildfires are going to rush through? Well, nobody does. Apparently, you can spend enough on insurance. You can build anywhere you want to. Uh, who builds on an earthquake fault? Well, apparently, lots of people do. <laughs> so just because the common man says that's the best place to build, and, and, and nobody would even dare think of doing that, obviously, lots of people do. And so he makes that comparison, first of all, of the man who builds his house on the rock. The rains fell. The floods came up. And and, 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 the, and the wind blew against it. You know the children's song, don't you? The rains came down and the floods. We repeat that for some reason. The rains came down and the floods came up. And I guess we repeat that a couple more times because maybe we didn't get it the first time. The rains come down and the floods came up. And then we eat. Then we add. Don't we, don't we talk about the wind blowing in the song? Oh, see. Um, now I'm lost in the children's song. Are the children's songs theologically strong? The biblically accurate? Some of them are. This one probably is too. I do think there's a mention of winds blowing against the house. And what does it say about the man who built his house on the rock? It stayed. It didn't crush. It didn't crumble. The winds didn't blow it over. The floods didn't wash it away. The rains didn't, didn't erode away of it. So Jesus is saying, those who hear his words of mine, and they act upon them, they obey them. Well, that's a wise man. That's that guy over there who built his house up there where it's hard and difficult. People thought, that's crazy to do that. Look how hard that is. But he did it. And rains come, the winds blow, the floods come up. But we'll talk about what might those things represent in just a moment. Move into the second builder, the second foundation, 
second house. We've already, we've already acknowledged that the rain fell on this house as well. And you know what happens when it rains oil, don't you? Water just begins to push it away, take it away. You've ever built a sand castle out on a beach? And the waves begin to push in on it? What happens? Then a couple of pushes of the wave... It's as though you never built anything. You know what happens whenever you have a house that's built on sand? And we get this in places where the wind blows out in the desert. And we have, a, we have an amazing structure out here south of Castleford. The great question mark in the desert. Uh, balance rock. Picture of, of what happens whenever, whenever you know, that's a rock. But everything that wasn't rock has been blown away from it. Who knows how much longer the Lord will tarry. And, and uh, it does appear that what's left there is rock, which is why it's still standing. But everything that wasn't rock has been blown away by the wind. So if you build on something that's sand, you should expect that over time, as the rains fall, as the winds blow, as the floods come up, that house will eventually crumble. And that's what we say. That's what Jesus is saying is the case for this individual. This builder who's built upon this kind of foundation. So everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house. And everyone looks around. So who does that? And everyone's thinking, well, I think I did back at home. I've got a house built on a pretty questionable foundation. And look at the masses of other people who did so because it was convenient and easy. It was affordable. So that's the route that they go. They take their chances. They build an elaborate place, a beautiful place. And what happens? The rain falls, the floods come, the winds blow. They slam against that house. And the great as it's fall, it crumbles. Because its foundation was on the sand. So we don't get any other interpretation. Jesus doesn't offer here's any like he does with the, the parable we'll look at next week, Lord willing. We'll look at one of the more popular parables. This one is, is actually, if there is such a thing as the parables of Jesus, this one would certainly be among them. Certainly popular because it's short. It's popular because it's visually um, helpful. But also the parable of the sower who goes out to sow. We'll look at that parable, Lord willing, next week. That's a little bit longer of a parable that comes with an explanation as to what everything represents. So one thing we have to do with parables is be careful that we not say what something means if it's not really the case. But we can also look at this and, and make some assumptions and make some, some characters about what do you think Jesus means fall and the floods come. Is there, is there a parallel to what he's meaning? Obviously, he's, he's making note. Out here, the wind blows. Out here, the rain falls. Out here, the, the, the floods come up. That house is going to face it, and this house is going to face it. So there's really not any, any, any problem with what he's structurally saying about these places, but is there anything implied by it when he says, the rain falls? What, what could be some of those possibilities? Trials, temptations. Trials, hardships, temptations. They're going to come, aren't they? They're going to come on that man who built his house up there on the rock. He knew that the best place to build. And he's going to face stormy days. He's going to face hardships. And this man down here, he's, he knows this. He built in a place that is notorious for disaster. And he knows that the rains are going to come. Hardships are going to happen. Difficulties, loss. Both people build on the foundations in which they build, knowing that that's just the way life is. One doesn't say, if I build up here, I won't have to go through hardships. If I build over there, I won't have problems like the guy who's building down there. They both build knowing, regardless of where they build, it's going to be hard which then I think even emphasizes the significance 
of the, of the man who builds on the rock and how, how wise, why Jesus calls him a wise man. And, and why, he, why the one who builds in the sand he calls a foolish man. They both, difficult days will come. They both know the rains will fall, the winds will blow, the floods will come. The end result is the one who hears these words of mine and obeys them. He's like that man. The man who hears these words of mine and does not obey them is like that man. Both know difficult, hard, unexplainable days are on the horizon. So that can be, a, and, and I believe is, a benefit for us to see in the story. It's pretty profound, isn't it? I think it's important that we as Christians get this. We must not come to the conclusion that if we go to church, all of our problems are going to disappear. We must not think that if we attend church and we and we and we and we give to the church that my marriage is going to get better. We cannot assume that just because we we obey the commandments of God that all things now are required of God for my life to go smooth and easy. You do not come to God foolishly, uninformed. This world carries with it difficulties. That come upon those who build in smart places and those who build in foolish places. This man, Jesus says, is smart. He's, he's wise because he's heard my words and he's obeyed my words and he built there because it's going to be hard at times. Temptations are going to arise. How is he going to overcome them if he's built? Listen, an alcoholic doesn't go and build his house inside of a bar. If he wants to see if he's a foolish man, he will. He knows he will still have the same craving to go and, and do those things that he once did, but now he's got to be smart about it. He's got to be wise about it. I cannot get myself into that lifestyle that so easily sucks me. One who has a propensity to lie. Know this, regardless of where you build, where, where you build, the desire of the enemy is to take you as far away from God as possible. So you surround yourself and, 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 and bathe yourself in the truth of God's word. This isn't just advice on how to overcome the woes of life. This is essentially speaking about eternal life. A wise man who hears these words of mine, and he responds accordingly. This man has weighed the cost of all that he's doing. And he sees that this place upon the rock. So who is the rock in the story? By the way, I should ask that question a couple of moments ago. Who is the rock? It's not a trick question. <laughs> it's an easy answer. Whenever we're looking at parables and parallels and what do they, re what do they represent? Yeah, the rock is Christ. And, and so ultimately, it's not about builders. The parable is not about houses. The parable is, is, is about foundations. The foundation of the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so there is the one notable, visible foundation that Jesus makes note of. And he, he calls it the rock. This man built his life upon these teachings of mine, knowing that if he's going to survive the hardships of the everyday world, this is where we build it. We build it on Christ and Christ alone. So to, 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 to look at the conclusion and back to the context of the verses before and the concluding moments of verse 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished these words, let, let, let's, let's make note of this parable if all we do is think Jesus only meant here when it, or that, that Matthew is saying when Jesus finished speaking this parable all we'll do is, is think about how cute and how good and what a profound little story that was what words has Jesus just finished speaking from chapter 5 chapter 6 chapter 7 what's called the sermon on the mount as when Jesus had finished these words, what, is, what does the text say about the response of the people? 
responding to his teaching. They're astonished. They're their jaws off. They're amazed. Now keep in mind, the parable of the of the foundations is not what has the jaw problems. They're not amazed by, oh, I never thought of that before. I'm going to go home and move my house to a better foundation. That's not what they're saying. They are amazed. They're astonished. They are shocked. By what? By his teaching. And what does verse 29 say about his teaching? For he was teaching them as one having authority. I think it's noteworthy. I believe the Holy Spirit inspires the words that we read of in the scripture. And I believe it's very noteworthy that Matthew doesn't say the people were entertained by his ability to tell a cute little story. They are amazed by his teaching. And the amazement of that is one who's teaching and one having authority. Not engineering authority of where is the best place to build a house. Encompass all of the Sermon on the Mount in this observation that Matthew makes. And he's saying this Jesus is one who's teaching with authority. And notably here, the conclusion of verse 29, not as their scribes. Well, Jesus did not win friends by telling cute little stories. He uses a story at the end of profound teaching. To speak perhaps in a shortened version of what he's been saying in a profound way. But, but his, his authority is not like that of the scribes. Well, so what, what would be a right response for the church to do in response to this kind of teaching? Well, we can do one of two things. We can adopt the methodology of short, concise, cute stories to entertain people, or we can include the whole of the sermon and see the profoundness and the authority in which Jesus teaches. And then we go forth and herald this news to all who he hears. Now that doesn't mean that we don't do anything for the benefit of those who are skirting the edges and are on the periphery and not sure about what's, what's happening here. Jesus essentially says his parables are designed that those who are on the verge, those who are those whom he is calling them to himself, they get these parables. But those who are on the outside who are looking to trip Jesus up or trick him into something, these are the ones he concludes with, that Matthew concludes with in his observation, as Jesus is not teaching like them. Those scribes who are out there who do not have and are not teaching as one who has authority. They're probably crafted up a million clever stories but not teaching with authority and essentially the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus kicking the chair out from underneath everything that the scribes had been doing they were amazed they were astonished they were shocked even I think that shock fell on both those who hated Jesus and those who were saying I get it I understand it now, not because of a clever little story, but because Jesus was speaking for it that the others had never spoken. Well, it's a very familiar parable, and uh, I think it's worthy of of extension and meditation upon. It would even it would even mean I think whenever Joel Beakey makes observation about how the Puritans meditated on Scripture. Now, let me leave you with this, that Joel Beakey made this observation of the Puritans, that whenever they would read a piece of Scripture, perhaps like this, that they would then, they would discipline themselves. He doesn't say this specifically about this piece of text, but this is how he would teach about how the Puritans would essentially disciple, discipline themselves to meditate on Scripture. Is they would take a piece of Scripture like this, 
And they would think about when the rain falls and think about everything related to the story that Jesus has told. And think about, look around, and they would even observe where's the shed at? Where, where did they build their house? They would look and see all of these things. And they would see, this, that's a foolish thing to do. And this is a good thing to do, a wise thing to do. They would, they would be in places where the floods would come. They would sit there and just ponder and meditate. And they would even watch how, how high the water lines are and, and just observe that and think, look how close to disaster this comes to here. And they would think about those things and then they would observe even deeper and think, where would be the best place to build if I were to build here? Knowing that the rains will fall, knowing that the winds will blow, knowing that the floods will come up. How then would I do that? And they would think about these things and meditate on them. And then ultimately to get to this position where they would ask the question primarily is really it's not an issue of where the rains fall, what direction are the winds blowing, how often do the floods come up. It really is where have I built my house? On what foundation have I built my whole life? On? Is it on the teachings of God, the authority of God? Or is it upon the wisdom of men and the philosophy of heart? And they would process through the day and be grateful that God has awakened them. And it allowed them grace to see how they And so I would encourage us to do the same. Think about it. We don't get flooding rains around here very often, but when we do, why not capture the moment and observe it, and meditate? Think about it. When the rains fall, it looks like from time to time the dump out buckets of water and passes by. That would be worth observing and thinking about. I mean, even right now, look how dark it is to the southwest of us. We may not get a drop of rain. But where have we built our house here? If it's downstream from there. Will it survive that storm? Will it, will it survive that disaster? Well, may God grant us grace to act with wisdom according to his teachings and obedience. Do you have any questions about the parable? Any thoughts? I don't, I don't come saying I, I have all the hidden secrets to the story. But what observations would you make or think about? I think if we were to live our life uh, in a selfish manner, when we die, we end up and we live it. Rings and knots, wishes we had something we had earthly. Where your, where your, well, as the scriptures say, where your heart is, or where, I'm going to get all mixed up, where your treasures are, there your heart is. We're selfish. Notably, everything we're doing is this temporal thing. In the kingdom of God, where there would be our treasure. I like this. Um, he's talking about everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. But I look at that, therefore, it's what was said right before that. He's talking about not everyone who says to the Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. There's going to be a lot of people standing before God. And, uh, these are religious, very religious people, and the people who hear these things, where do you just think the Jews and the Pharisees? And they're going to stand before Jesus, and they're, he's, he's saying it very high authority. That's they're amazing. He's saying, it, we're going to stand before you. I'm going to say to you, Far from it. Or to even have the authority to say enter to eternal rest. That's authority. If you look at a huge authority, that's given Jesus their <clears throat> a huge say. Who did it in and who not? And I look at that authority that they're listening to and saying, Jesus says, I understand for you. I, I think that's, I don't know if that's. The whole thing probably did, but just the things that 
you're going to stand before me. And I'm going to say, part. That's good. So we should go with the desire to want to behave like the wise man. He hears all these things that Jesus says and obeys. Lord, we ask that you would help us. God, even, even as we depart from here in the coming moments, the coming days, cause us to reflect upon the teaching of the parable and keep it in context of the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. What profoundness, what spiritual richness, what nuggets in the, in the fine field of glory. Oh, dear God, may we, may we be intentional to build our lives on a firm place, on a solid place, on a tested place. Whenever hardships and difficulties arise and come to our lives, and we know that they will, we will not take our eyes off of our hope. This rock, this Jesus the Christ, be the Savior of our life. Oh, what a good place to rest. What a good place to build. What a good place to establish. Oh, Lord, will you help us to be like wise builders? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.